We are having some problems with the socks that I knit for my dad. Hello, my name is Allie, and this is my channel where I talk about what I'm knitting, how it's going, and what it's costing me. Thank you so much for being here. And I'm coming to you from just outside Toronto, Canada. And I realized that I'm not always good. I'm mentioning that a couple weeks ago, Lindsay from Always Yarn First. A couple weeks ago, Lindsay from Always Yarn First was so nice as to give me a shout out on her channel. She was like, and I'm not really sure where she's from, and I'm not sure if I missed it. And I was like, oh no, I don't think she missed it. I think I just forgot to say it. So first of all, thank you so much to Lindsay. Which by the way, you should go check out Lindsay's channel. I can't talk to the camera like I'm talking to a person. Um, so I have to edit a lot. And then there are people like Lindsay who sit down and hit record and talk to you like you're just like hanging out with a friend. It's just so nice and relaxed and I don't understand how she can do it all with so few cuts. Also similar category, I wanna shout out Haley from Knit Weekend who also mentioned me in her podcast, which why are all of you so nice and welcoming like immediately? Was not expecting and Haley is also delightful. Go watch Haley on Knit Weekend. She has an adorable cat who makes appearances and if you've been here before, you know that my dad is a frequent mention on the channel. I'm always knitting him socks. He made me these bookshelves, etc., etc. And Haley also has a prominent dad in her channel. So I feel like we have a little bit of like a kinship there. So if you're looking for new podcasts, always Aaron first and Knit Weekend, go check them out. So today I'm drinking my favorite Sloan Classic Earl Grey tea out of this mug, which I got from well.ca, which is like a Canadian online drugstore. And I think it cost me like $12. There's also kind of a tragic backstory to this mug situation today because I was actually planning to use a different mug. And I was planning to come to you guys and be like, hey guys, this is one of my favorite mugs. It's this beautiful mug I got from this art gallery in Stratford. Unfortunately, it has this crack starting to form in it. What do you recommend I do? I'm familiar with the concept of like Kintsugi, which beautiful, love that idea, but it's not actually broken apart. Is there something I can do while it's just cracked to prevent it from breaking further? Um, and in trying to get the mug ready to do all that, I actually broke the mug. <laughs> so I don't know, it was just very, um, careful what you wish for, I guess, in thinking that I wished it was a good uh, candidate for Kintsugi. So now it is. So as for what I am wearing today, this is my quilted sweater jacket from Alexandra Tavel. This is the one that has the fun mismatched cuffs and see if I can get my pockets in. You also have, I was bad at doing this in my everything I've ever knit and I'm bad at doing it now, but here are my fun pockets um, that I modified the pattern to include. I made my own little color chart for them. Um, so if you'd like to hear more details about this one, you can check out my everything I've ever knit. I'll link that one. So this pattern includes sizing for up to a chest between 57 and 63 inches. The pattern gives like a range of how much positive ease it recommends. So that's the range of chest sizes that it can accommodate. So it's sort of like dancing around the 60 inch benchmark that we're looking for. So mileage may vary on that one. I knit this between April and May of 2022. So I've actually had this for almost two years now. This was my first garment that I knit. Um, so I've had a lot of time to get a lot of use out of it. And I have, like I wear this both as part of like outfits and I also wear it basically like a house coat. <laughs> like anytime I'm cold in my house, this is what I reach for. So I have worn it 90 times since I made it, which feels like a pretty good number. That brings my cost per wear to $1.75 Canadian. I think the total cost, including pattern and yarn was like 187, something like that. I would check with my calculator, but my calculator is my phone and my filming camera is also my phone. So that also works out to about $1.30 US per wear for reference. So my general benchmark is I'm trying to get things like under a dollar for cost per wear in most cases that tends to make me feel like I got good wear out of it. So we're like well on our way. So I feel like it should be no problem getting it under a dollar. I also have to say that the last time I recorded a video, I was wearing my white Magnolia Bloom sweater, which um, side note, so that video is not the most recent one that would have gone up on the channel because I was sneaky and I pre-recorded the most recent video that went up to go up while I was actually away on vacation. But so when I recorded that video with my Magnolia Bloom sweater, I said, you know, this is probably the last time I can wear this this season. Um, jokes on me. So while I was away, I was seeing people at home being like, oh my God, like spring is here. They're in t-shirts outside. I get off the train. I spend like maybe 60 seconds outside trying to locate my Uber. And in that time, I am like accosted by winter. The winds, they're whipping, the snow is hurling at my face. And this was also um, the actual first day of spring. I think I really jinxed it by saying that the season for the Magnolia Bloom was over. I also would like to mention, I got a hilarious comment on a recent video saying like, you know, I really enjoy your videos, but I miss half of what you're saying because of how fast you talk, <laughs> which is not surprising to me. My own mother tells me this constantly. Um, unfortunately, I don't, I don't really think that's a thing that I um, have a whole lot of control over. It just kind of happens. But my favorite part of this was that someone else responded to this comment being like, actually, if you click this little button on YouTube, you can adjust the speed. Hey, like, drag me. <laughs> 
I talk so fast that we need to bring in the like 0.75 speed control, but also what like an actual earnestly great suggestion. <laughs> so like, I can accept that the speed at which I talk is a problem for some people, but if that is in fact a problem for you, good news, here's how you fix it. <laughs> okay, so exciting news. Today we actually have finished objects finished object singular but well act no you know what no because they're socks so that is finished objects plural so in my last video where I was actually giving like whip updates um I was talking about the socks that I was working on for my dad for his birthday and saying that I was hoping that by the time the next video happened they would be done and I am pleased to announce that they are however <laughs> those socks are no longer in my possession so I will pop up some pictures here so you can see what they look like um, my dad was so kind as to model them on his feet for me. However, he did decline to have his face in the photos because, and I quote, I have bed head. So maybe someday we'll be so lucky as to be graced by dad's face on the YouTube channel, but that day will not be today. So for his birthday, I knit him these snuggly socks from Isabel Gerzebic. Um, this is a pattern that comes in three different sizes and I knit him size three, the largest one. The pattern costs uh, $6 US or $8.50 Canadian-ish. So as far as the yarn, I knit these out of Filcolana Peruvian in the color 833 Limpopo, which is this sort of heathered gray color. And I broke into three skeins. I used two entirely, and then I used maybe a third of the third skein. I ordered these from the Galt House of Yarn. But so when I was ordering this yarn, my thinking was that I was ordering yarn to make two pairs of socks. And I was ordering four balls of each color to be safe because I, I have a history of running out of yarn and if I end up with extra I can use for something else great but in my mind when I was making this purchase I was buying eight balls of yarn and it was for two pairs of socks so the four balls of yarn cost $32 and then half of the shipping of the order because the other half was for the other four balls for another pair of socks was five dollars so that's about $37 for the yarn another $8.50 for the pattern so that means that all in they cost about $45 which is about $34 US maybe. So of note, I knit these on four millimeter needles up from the 3.5 millimeters that the pattern suggests because I am a tight knitter and this is always a problem. So I upsized to fours, but this actually worked out really well because four millimeters is the one size of needle that I actually have more than one of because I have an interchangeable circular set. This is what I use for everything, but that interchangeable set is metal needles. And I learned the hard way <laughs> that when you're traveling to certain international destinations, metal knitting needles are actually considered knives. They get classified under the like stabby metal object section that is labeled knives. So you cannot bring them on the plane because of course you can't bring knives on the plane. But if you have wooden knitting needles, those are just fine. So last year I was coming home from a vacation in Mexico and airport security confiscated my four millimeter metal knitting needle. <laughs> And fortunately, I was able to replace it. The set that I have, the Luca Cypress set, you can actually buy individual needles in that set. So I was able to replace that four millimeter. And I also bought the Luca, I think the Driftwood four millimeter one so that I would have a travel version for the next time. This worked out really well because it gave me an opportunity to try out the idea of knitting two at a time on two separate circulars. Which actually I should clarify, I learned when I had asked in a previous video about what's the deal with two at a time on two separate circulars. I don't understand the difference between that and magic loop. Why do you do it? How does it even work? I had one viewer, Daniel, shout out Daniel, directed me to this particular video from Roxanne Richardson explaining how the two circular method works. And she actually clarifies in that video that you actually don't need two needles of the same size to do this because the way that it works when you're using two circulars in parallel as opposed to doing magic loop is that the needle, the needle, the needle that you're knitting with on each side, it's always the same end of it. So the needle that's on the other end, the one that your stitches are just resting on before they get picked up to be knit, it can actually be a smaller size and it will always work out. And that also really puzzled my brain. Like I really had to do it myself and watch it and pay really close attention to like understand how that was happening. However, I'm glad that I was able to test this out easily with two needles that were the same size because the problem that I had was that I am so used to magic loop that I kept accidentally grabbing the wrong needle and ending up with it all back on one needle. <laughs> like I, I would turn it around and go to start the next section and realize that my second needle had like fallen down beside me because there were no longer any stitches on it because instead of grabbing the needle tip from this end that I'm supposed to carry over here to do this side, I would grab the needle from in behind and start knitting the way you do in magic loop. Like I just, it was just the force of habit was so strong. The muscle memory was so strong that I kept doing it. Like I used that technique for 
I think about this much of the socks at the end. And in the span of however many rows fit into this, which like in air and weight, it's not a ton. I ended up with things back on one needle accidentally doing magic loop five times. <laughs> five times I went, oh no, and had to put my second one like manually back in, like I had to reset it up. So I, I feel like I can't even accurately assess how I feel about this method because I made it more annoying <laughs> by virtue of the fact that I just couldn't do it. Like subconsciously, I kept reverting back to magic loop. So I don't know, I think next time I do a pair of socks, I will probably try it again and see if I can get my brain to override this because I, I do think that I could see it being a little bit nicer. I don't think that for me, it's world changing, but I do feel like I spent less time shoving stitches around than I do in Magic Loop. But at the same time, you are still doing that. It's not that you're not doing it ever, but I think you're doing less of it and it's a bit easier. And I do hate that part of Magic Loop. So that is like a potential selling feature. That is what is motivating me to like, see if I can override my like accidental automatic Magic Looping. Um, so I will try that again, but yeah, I don't think I see a huge advantage in that way. Also, it was interesting working on these with the wooden needles when I went away. So I had started these socks at home for a couple weeks. I'd only done a little bit of them. I'll actually pop in a picture where you can see the little um, stitch marker that's marking how much I had done the last time I featured them in a video. So I hadn't done a whole lot, but I'd done all of that on my metal needles. And then I packed these to go with me on the family trip to Italy that I was just on. I thought they would be a really good thing to have with me on this really long plane ride. So I thought these would be a great portable project. The wooden needle I already have happens to be the exact right size. Perfect, I'll bring it. I don't think I had actually used this wooden needle for anything before and I was actually shocked by how different it seemed. I know that wooden needles are very popular for people to learn on but I never used them. I initially used the needles that um, Grams, my grandmother got me started knitting, um, had and they were the sort of like, I think they're like plastic coated metal and so when I got my interchangeable set I got a set of metal needles and I remember at the time I went into my um, now, unfortunately, defunct local yarn store. And the woman working there actually tried to talk me out of it. She was like, you know, it's a really nice set, but like, if you're just starting out, I would not invest in a full set, especially not a full metal set, until you've had a chance to like try them out and make sure that that's what you want. I would actually suggest you buy like one of these individual ones. Don't buy a whole set, just buy one and see how you feel about it. And if there's one thing about me, it's that I'm stubborn. And if there's another thing about me, it's that I'm incredibly picky and have very specific tastes. <laughs> so I was like, I hear what you're saying. This makes perfect sense. I, actually, I can't find any hole in your logic whatsoever. However, this copper set of metal needles is stunningly beautiful and perfect, and it is what I need to have. <laughs> so I bought them against everyone's better judgment. And I have absolutely no regrets about that. I've used those needles for the last almost two years at this point, very happily, not had any problems. And using this wooden needle, I was like, oh my God, get me back to my metal needles. And this was so surprising to me actually, because I've seen people talk about wooden needles being better for beginners because they're grippier, there's more texture, you don't have stitches accidentally slipping off as easily, da da da. And I was like, okay, I see in theory how that makes sense. But when I look at a wooden needle, all the needles I've seen, they still seem smooth like okay of course metal's gonna be smoother but like is it smoother to a degree that makes a difference oh my god let me tell you it makes a difference i stand corrected i <laughs> i was like why is it going so slowly i missed my metal needles and then when i got home it was really funny trying to then start doing the two circular needles because one set was metal and one was wood. The difference was stark. I guess if I think about it, this was a project where I was kind of trying a lot of different things also because so not only was I trying the idea of knitting on two circulars at a time rather than magic loop. This is also one of the first cases where I have tried wet splicing my yarns together and I am very specifically saying wet splicing and not spit splicing. A, because I find the word spit splicing repulsive like I actually I actually think that the act of spit splicing itself grosses me out less than the term so if the same is also true for you I'm sorry that I've now said it like seven times but I also just can't quite bring myself to the act of spit splicing either so I got a little glass of water and I just did some dunking and I have like mixed feelings about this 
The one time I had done this before was with my reading socks and I didn't love it there in part because like those are knit with such bulky wool and so okay it kind of tracks that when you try to wet splice two ends of those together even if you do successfully get it to kind of match the size of the rest of the strand it's now twice as dense which means that the stitch kind of takes on like a more like sculptural three-dimensional <laughs> shape than the other stitches around it so it just kind of like stood out a little more than I liked so I thought well maybe it'll work better in an errand weight so I tried it again here but I'm honestly not convinced that it worked any better and maybe this is just me not being good at wet splicing I kind of I got them wet I kind of pulled apart the the plies of yarn at the end so that I could sort of like inter splice them I guess I guess that's the word um and then like rub them together and it just it just still seemed a bit chunky when I was knitting with it it just felt like it was behaving weird and then I do think that it improved with blocking but I can still see where it is so I don't know I'm not entirely convinced by that and I also this is just a me problem but I really like hated the feeling of like this wet wool then like rubbing between my head like oh I just ugh. I don't know I think wet splicing is like a no for me but I'm curious if like the problems that I'm describing, like if you're sitting there being like, oh, no, 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 like you're just doing this wrong, do this different and it'll be great. Let me know. Because right now I'm like, why? Why is anyone doing this? I hate it. <laughs> this was also my first use of the Fish Lips Kiss Heel. So I mentioned in the last video where I was talking about the socks that I was thinking I was going to try it, but that I was seeing a lot of people being very intimidated. I don't know if you can hear Copper panting in the background, but he is laying in the like foremost sunny spot on the floor over here and loving his life so you might hear that <laughs> so I was seeing a lot of people being very intimidated by the fish lift kiss heel but also hearing that it was incredible and so it seemed like okay there's a steep learning curve and not even a steep learning curve so much as a steep getting past all of the pages in the pattern that aren't actually necessary to get to the actual information so I am happy to report that I feel like I can say that I did that so the pattern is 16 pages long and I mean I don't think I've ever even knit a sock pattern that was 16 pages long, let alone a pattern for just the heel of the sock. So I understand how this is not like encouraging to people. If you are feeling stressed about it, overwhelmed about it, you can skip most of them and I will tell you which ones because you know what? I didn't read the extra pages either. So I can tell you for a fact that they are not necessary <laughs> to making this work. So I just looked through the pattern to check the pages that you actually want to reference to knit the heel are pages nine to 11, three pages. And in fact, the third page is half empty. So two and a half pages, that's it. It's a much more reasonable size pattern. There is a lot of really good information at the start of the pattern from what I could see just skimming it, how to measure the wearer's foot and kind of create these little templates that you can have on hand of like the feet of all the people that you knit for so that you can knit socks for everybody very easily without them having to try them on. So I do think that there is a lot of value in those extra pages if you want it, but if all you want is to knit the heel and not to feel um, absolutely drowned in information, pages nine to 11. You're good to go. And as far as the process of actually knitting it, I really liked it. I found it less disruptive than doing a heel flap and gusset, which is the only type of sock that I've made before. Um, it was just less, I mean, okay, here's what it is really. I hate picking up stitches. I also just find, well, I, ju I just don't like any time I have to stop and read the pattern while I'm knitting. I don't like that interruption to the flow. And I at least found it with the fish lips kiss heel. Well, of course I did have to stop and like, okay, how do I do this now? Once I got it going, there was a lot less, okay, now what? Okay, now what? Okay, now what? Like, you're not doing your flap. Okay, now I've done my flap. How many stitches did I pick up? Okay, how do I do the gusset? Okay, how do I go back to knitting? Like, it just, it's more straightforward once you get it going. It's just, it just felt more elegant to me as a process. So I do think that this is a method that I will be using again. I'm also very curious to see how this affects the fit and the way that they wear. So part of the way that the Fish Lips Kiss Heel is marketed is the idea that it gives you a much better fit and... I can see why that would make a lot of sense. So from the picture, you can see that the Fish Lips Kiss Heel really creates this like jutting out heel that really more accurately follows the shape of your foot in a way that the heel flap, I guess it like really doesn't. And it, okay, it will kind of take on that shape and accommodate that with a foot inside of it, but it's not like made for it. You know what I mean? So these socks I cast on on February 10th and I finished them on March 21st, which was down to the wire because my dad's birthday is March 22nd. So 
I there was kind of a lull in the middle here so I started them on February 10th I wanted to make sure I knew what I was doing and got kind of a head start but then I kind of deliberately put them to the side thinking I'm gonna want to bring these on the trip to Italy I did in fact end up working on these a lot on the plane both ways and I did also work on them on our travel train day so we were traveling between Venice where we started our trip and the Amalfi Coast which was most of the rest of our trip so we had almost an entire day we had like a five and a half hour train ride to get between the two places and I was working on these socks on that train so I wanted to keep them available to work on on the trip what I didn't really think all the way through was that I only packed one ball of yarn for each sock I don't I don't know what I was thinking maybe I was just thinking I did not have enough room for a third so it didn't matter but what I had not factored in was that I was arriving home on the 20th of March my dad's birthday is the 22nd of March <laughs> so I did a lot of knitting on March 21st and I blocked it on March 21st and I gifted them to my dad still on the sock blockers um still slightly damp <laughs> on March 22nd I got to his house with a gift bag and was like okay you want to open this sooner than later because um we're gonna want to let these air out it was down to the wire but it happened they they were dry a few hours later but it it was a close call so when dad put them on it does seem like a nice fit his other socks never seemed like a bad fit but this is where i need to pick your brain and ask if you have experience in this area because we are having some problems with the socks that i have previously knit for my dad let me show you so oh no one just fell behind my piano i'll have to dig that out later but so for christmas i made him a pair of socks that have been featured on the channel before and the last time I featured them, they looked like this. See how nice and long the leg of the sock is. And this is a topic we have touched on before on this channel that, you know, the first time that I made my dad's socks, I kind of learned the hard way that um, when something has to stretch widthwise, it gets shorter to a degree that I didn't really understand. So when I was making him socks and I pulled them up on me and they seemed like a reasonable length, when they went on his leg, they became like ankle socks. So when I made him this second pair of socks for Christmas, I knew this and I was like okay great I will knit them longer it's fine I got measurements from my mom of some of his other pairs of socks just to know okay this is the measurements that it should be and then they'll work well and when he got them he put them on and that did work well they were the right length all was well um but now he has worn them and critically has not washed them has not put them in the dryer like these are not factors at play and yet they look like this like how how did they become ankle socks? <laughs> so backstory. So my dad loves to snowmobile and his favorite use for his wool socks is to wear them on snowmobiling trips. They're really good for this weird situation where you're out in the cold all day long, but you are kind of stationary. Like you're just sitting on your machine and weirdly kind of your upper body is working as you steer. So you're kind of exerting yourself up here and can get like sweaty on the top half but your feet are just sitting there, just getting cold. So it's really critical to have good socks. So dad loves the wool socks because they're good for that. And because they're wool, gross fact about dad, he's thrilled that he can wear the same socks for the entire week of his snowmobiling trip. He showed me, he was like, I love the socks. They were fantastic, but could you maybe knit them a bit longer or something? Cause they keep shrinking. And <laughs> I don't understand. I was like, you didn't put them in the dryer? He's like, no. And I'm like, I guess what must be happening is that in his well-insulated snowmobile boots, they must be keeping in so much of his body heat that it's actually creating enough heat that it's shrinking. Like, I can also see that the bottom is definitely felting. I don't know if you can see that on camera. I can definitely feel it. But the leg has not felted. It doesn't feel that way it's just short and the foot itself has not shrunk in length either so i mean i guess so this is obviously all happening while it's on his foot so it's like the foot itself is keeping the foot of the sock the right size but it's like this part just keeps somehow like slipping down and down so i'm wondering if maybe somehow maybe because of the construction of the heel this this is what i'm wondering about with the fish lips kiss heel Maybe with the construction of the heel, if it kind of wasn't fitting naturally and was kind of causing the leg to just slip under and under to become more and more of the heel, that maybe that's what's happening. Like maybe is the foot supposed to end like here and this used to all be leg and now it's just sort of created an ankle because I'm trying to even see if I can see where the gusset, it's so felted now that it's hard to even identify the gusset, but I'm actually wondering this might actually be 
the heel flap and the gusset, I think I see a bit of diagonal action going on here, which would mean the leg has kind of become foot. <laughs> leg is foot, I think is what has happened. So I'm not sure if that just means that the foot of the sock wasn't big enough in the first place, or is it possible that just because of a heel structure that isn't as natural to the shape of a foot that just maybe through this series of motions because it didn't fit naturally it just kind of kept like slipping in the, in the way that your socks will slip down in your boots sometimes you know so maybe it's just that so I'm curious to see if his new pair of socks does the same thing or if perhaps the fish lips kiss heel helps prevent some of this I think that the best thing to do will just be to try to add length which is going to be a little bit unnatural because these were knit cuffed down so I will just have to pick up stitches and knit the other way it's not going to be um beautiful or seamless but I did check with dad I was like form or function here which one's more important and he 100% would just rather have socks that are long enough <laughs> so I think that's what I'm going to do um but please let me know if this is the thing you've encountered before, if you have any insights on this. Also, I should mention, I got these cute little tags made um, that I can put on garments. So I had these made from a little Etsy shop. I will pop them up here. And they, they were really great about letting me put like multiple different versions just on one sheet. Oh no, I nudged the camera. Hopefully that's like roughly the same. No, it's too high. And then I also had larger ones made to put in garments. They're just made out of this, um, I think like cotton twill material. Um, and then I just sewed them on and they're just like really cute. I feel like it just adds such a cute like finishing touch to things, especially when you are giving them as a gift. I guess when I knit this longer, I will have to remove and <laughs> reattach this tag higher up, but that's fine. And then back on the sock front, we also have, this was the first pair of socks that I knit dad. So these were the ones that, you know, it was immediately apparent that they were kind of ankle sock, but they have become more so. And I do think, I think we're seeing the same problem. Like I think that Think that that's the he the heel flap gusset area like you can see where the um stitch pattern changes right from the ribbing into the stockinette and you can see that the ribbing has become part of the heel shape so i think it's not that dad's foot is too big for the size socks that i'm knitting when they start out because they do always seem to fit well at first but i think the problem must be that with the felting that's happening at the bottom as like the friction is creating heat that then the bottom is shrinking and so then the leg is becoming part of the bottom. Is there a way to avoid that without the sock being comically oversized when you first put them on before the bottom is felt? Does the little bit of nylon that's often in sock yarn also help prevent felting in this way? Because I know that that's a thing that's often there for like durability so that your socks don't wear out so quickly. But I'm wondering now if what I'm also missing in using pure wool for socks is that it might also help prevent some of that felting and therefore fit issues over time. I don't know. Please, if, if you know things about socks, if you know this problem, if you've had this problem, if you've fixed this problem, please let me know because I'm happy to fix these socks by adding more length for dad, but I would like to not have to take back every sock I ever make for him to end up adding several inches a few months later. Okay, so moving on to whips. I have to show you the largest project bag. So here's the thing. My no frills cardigan is no longer a portable project. So the last time it was on the channel, it was like on the cusp. Like I could pack it very tightly and like squish it into my purse just barely. I haven't actually made a ton of progress on it, but enough that like that's not really not really a thing anymore. So I decided that it was time to um, upgrade its project bag to, so I <laughs> I recently bought um, a new suitcase and it came in this giant cotton drawstring bag. And um, this is now my project bag, <laughs> which the advantage of switching to this one because the cardigan itself did still fit in the previous uh, drawstring bag, but it did not fit with all of its yarn. And I was like, okay, this is no longer portable anyway. I might as well just start keeping all the yarn with it. And it's also in this like comically large bag, but also like, look how much bulk of this bag is taken up. Like by the time the sweater's done, I don't think it's gonna seem that unreasonable. So if you are not aware, I am knitting the No Frills Cardigan by Petite Knit, which is intended to be like a, I keep saying floor length. I was watching, I think it was AKA Nora Knits. She's also knitting a very long cardigan. 
and she referred to it as duster length and I was like oh yeah that's that's what it's called that's that's what I'm supposed to be calling this this is a duster length cardigan well not now but it will be and so it's gonna be real big so let me see if I can oh god here it is and we can see down here this is my stitch marker from the last time that I showed this on camera so we've got another few inches so not a ton I was mostly focusing on dad socks um I just did a little bit before I left and since I've gotten home I think honestly most of this I did yesterday I think I was about here when I started working on this yesterday but I worked on this for like a lot of yesterday <laughs> so last time I tried it on and felt like okay this is where if this were a regular spider I would be starting the ribbing it would be like almost done so let me try this on and we can see okay we have like a sweater like yeah if this were a regular sweater this would be done this would even maybe be long we're I guess close to where the pockets will go um I do believe the pockets are afterthought pockets but I would probably do them as a mid project thought rather than an afterthought just to get them over with um so once I'm done the pockets it'll just be like keep knitting until the ankles except that um I am thinking that I probably will want to do again like a mid project block just to make sure that the length is coming out the way that I think it is because I don't there's just like a lot of potential for gravity to be a thing on this project there's just there's a lot of fabric that could weigh itself down so I think it's going to be important to check that before I bind off and maybe find that the sweater is like a foot longer than I want it to be and I'm walking on it that would be unfortunate so I do think that will be important but I'm feeling like it's probably about halfway there which is good and I hope is accurate because I think I have just finished half of my balls of yarn of the merino. If I'm not halfway done, we might have a problem, <laughs> but fingers crossed. So this project is the No Frills Cardigan by Petite Knit. I'm knitting this in a size extra small and the pattern includes sizing for up to a 59 inch bust. So like A minus on size inclusivity, you know, not bad, but we could always see better. So this pattern costs 45 Danish kroner or about $9 Canadian. And I'm knitting this out of the Knitting for Olive Merino in the color Mustard as well as the We Are Knitters Touch Me Mohair, also in the color mustard, because that was nice of them to coordinate. Um, and again, as discussed, not, not mohair, it's mostly alpaca, don't be fooled, but they're really nice combo together. They give me this nice sunny yellow that I was looking for. I searched far and wide <laughs> for a combo that was the color that I wanted. Immediately, I got an email from We Are Knitters one day being like, our mohair is on super sale. And I was like, okay, well, let's go see what you have. Maybe you happen to have the right yellow and they had the perfect yellow and it was half off. So I ordered both of these directly from each respective company. So I ordered 10 balls of the Knitting for Olive Merino, which cost me it was 65 euros plus 10, 50 euros in shipping, which is half of the total order. But I bought this at the same time that I bought the yarn for my classic rib. Um, and I also got hit with duty on that one. So I paid 19 Canadian dollars in duty, um, which again is about half because the total order had other yarn. The We Are Knitters one cost me 83.60 Canadian, but I do believe that was half off or at least very close for eight balls of this. So noteworthy, these are huge. Um, this is 50 grams or 400 meters, um, whereas the Merino is 50 grams or 250 meters. So this is almost double this. Um, I ordered eight of these to be on the super safe side. If they hadn't been on sale, I probably would have ordered seven and still felt like that was probably safe. But again, I seem to always somehow run out of yarn. So I thought, let's be really, really safe. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how much of this I end up with in the end. But all of that altogether, I paid $17 also shipping on these. So everything in, once you add up all of the yarn, I spent about $230 on yarn. Um, with the pattern, it's about $240 Canadian, and that converts out to about $175 US dollars. Also, you can thank my new giant project bag for the fact that I had these ones that are still untouched and nicely labeled to show you because they were conveniently in my project bag and not, you know, on another floor of my house. As always, I'm not knitting these on the needle size that is written in the pattern. I am knitting on a 4.5 millimeter needle rather than the 4 millimeter that is recommended. And that is getting me perfect stitch gauge. The question mark is the row gauge. So my row gauge was coming up a little bit off. I had more rows than there were supposed to be within the four inches, but I chose to go ahead with it anyway. A, because I feel like the row gauge is not super critical in a pattern like this. And as confirmed by the fact that I've tried it on now and the sleeves fit 
great. I feel like the sleeves is the one area where you might run into an issue if your row gauge was really off. And other than that, I can just keep knitting until it's the number of inches I want it to be. So that's not a problem. But I'm also thinking that there's a very good chance that because this is such a long piece that gravity will make up the difference for me once the cardigan is knit in its entirety. So we'll see how much that's true. We'll see how much blocking does or does not affect it. I'm hopeful that that will come up about equal to. If it doesn't, I think this is where I often run into the problem of running out of yarn because part of my tight knitting, tight gauge, is that I just end up needing to knit more stitches than other people do to make up the same amount of fabric. So I'm hopeful that I have enough this time that there won't be an issue. However, um, famous last words. So in terms of style, in addition to being a duster length cardigan, um, it's also a raglan style and it's knit flat because it's a cardigan. Um, from the top down and it is just all over stockinette with this really simple um, two stitch raglan and I just think it's going to be a really nice like simple staple piece in structure but in this fun pop color that I think is going to be really nice to have in my wardrobe I do love fun colors so I'm looking forward to it being complete um, but I think forward is really the operative word there <laughs> because we're looking very very forward very far like I it has taken me almost three months to get this far so if I'm hopefully halfway done we're looking at another three months probably I do also want to circle back though on some things that I mentioned about this in my last project update so last time I mentioned that I had this weird issue where I found like a strange loop that I couldn't figure out how to resolve I had noticed like a weird imperfection in the fabric and I had dropped the stitch down to try to fix what I assumed was just maybe I had caught only one of the two strands or something. And when I dropped it down, I found that instead of a ladder that I could pick up as usual, I just had a loop. And I showed footage of this. I showed me being like, what's going on? Help. And let me tell you, I had no idea how quickly having a knitting YouTube channel would be so helpful to me because you seem to know the answer to everything. I don't know, like just the, <laughs> the knowledge in this community and the willingness to write comments explaining things to me is just, thank, thank you. So last time I showed this problem, I had three separate people. I had Pollock, Amanda, and JS each commented saying, I think what you have is an accidental short row. It looks like most likely you were knitting a row put it down mid row, came back to it, and accidentally picked up from the wrong side. So instead of having knit along your row, paused, picked it up and continued knitting along your row, you had knit along your row, picked it up accidentally from the wrong side and knit back this way. And that's what creates that little loop. And this makes so much sense. Like I, this, this is something that I am typically diligent about I don't usually have this issue I usually pick it up and say okay which side is my working yarn on where is it coming from where does it need to go great but I can very much see how in the course of the hundreds of rows that make up this cardigan I can see how one time <laughs> I would maybe not have been paying attention and picked it up the wrong way so this makes perfect sense gives me further incentive to look out for this in the future and just like this was such a mystery to me. So thank you so much to the three of you for explaining this to me because I never would have figured this out. I, w I had no idea. I was so perplexed by it. So if you also were perplexed by it, now you know. So unfortunately, I also learned by learning this that the only way to actually fix that is in fact to frog back. There is no way to like pick it up in a way that's going to solve the issue because a weird thing happened. You just do have to rip back if you actually want to resolve it. But I decided not to. I decided to just kind of like pull on the stitches on either side to even out a bit. I also had asked in that video when I when I didn't know what the problem was, but I was like, is this worth ripping back and frogging? And the consensus very much seemed to be absolutely do not go back. That will block out just fine. Don't worry about it. So thank you for reassuring me about that. I feel like it's the right decision. I feel validated in that. I had also asked in that video about the underarm issue because I've been talking about how, like I do try to be diligent in my underarm hole pickups to pick up extra stitches as much as I need to make sure that I'm getting really good coverage around the perimeter. And then I will just decrease stitches as needed to get the right stitch count. But I feel like even when I do that, I still end up with some holes in the armhole. And I was like, I, this just like drives me out of my mind. Am I the only person who seems to care about this? Why do I not see more people talking about this? And I asked whether anyone had recommendations for 
a solid tutorial on how to avoid doing this. And again, there is a consensus. So four separate people, Suli, Amanda, Jillian, and Camilla all said Roxanne Richardson, who again, you'll remember, she's the one who Daniel recommended to learn how to do the two at a time circulars. So just Roxanne Richardson is queen, presumably for everything. I don't know. We've only had the sample size of two, but that, that's the conclusion I'm gathering. So I have not yet watched that video. I'm planning on just doing that the next time I need to pick up for a sleeve on a new project. But just so you know, if you are also having this problem, Roxanne Richardson seems to be the place to go. So I think that's all that I have to say about this one today. And I do think this is going to be the project that I am just focusing on for the next little while. So it'll be interesting to see how much progress I've been able to make by the next time that it's featured on the channel. Okay, my second whip, very small, very small update. So this is the um, swatch for my Fausta bralette, which um, has not gotten any further than the swatch since the last time that you would have seen it, except for um, ideologically, because in my How I Mock Up My Knits video, I got a comment from a viewer, Shayna, who thankfully <laughs> was like, are you aware that if you do a provisional cast on in ribbing, you, you're gonna see it. Because I had mentioned in that video, I was just talking about a different project. I was talking about what I might do with my um, Hedgehog's Fiber swatch that is like perpetually floating around this channel in like a permanent state of uncertainty about what it will become. Um, and I was talking about using that for a two by two rib design where I wanted to be able to just maximize the length of it, but that design is bottom up. So I was talking about realizing, oh, I could do a provisional cast on knit up and then just use whatever yarn I have left and knit down. Um, and she pointed out to me that in stockinette that works really well and you usually can't really see it, but in ribbing, because what happens with a provisional cast on is your, your stitches effectively end up being offset by like half a stitch when you start knitting the other way, that in ribbing, you will see a little jog in your ribbing. And so she was just posing the question of, will that matter to you? That might be something you want to think about. And that is something I want to think about. And it does throw a wrench into my thoughts for the Fausta bralette because this pattern is also knit bottom up. And my thinking was, I want to knit it into a full length top. And again, I will just knit the bralette as instructed, but from a provisional cast on, and then I will knit the other way down. I'll probably do some waist shaping, da da da, but I will just use up whatever length I have available or whatever maximum length I might possibly want it to be, whichever comes first. So now I'm at this question and I think I have, there's maybe only one option here. There might be another option and this is where I'm coming to you. So the option that is obvious to me, though scary, is that I could just attempt to knit it entirely bottom up, but adding in my own inches and adding in my own shaping just based off of gauge calculations and measurements of similar tops like when I did my classic rib I did waist shaping so I could base it off of that and how that fits and position it similarly and just trying to figure out then okay how many rows in the gauge of this pattern is it going to take me to get to this many inches that I liked in this other design it makes me a little bit nervous because blocking can shift that and like with my classic rib I found that my waist shaping was flawless when I was knitting it and then after blocking I feel that it's a little off the whole garment got a little bigger so I'm just a little bit worried about like there's already that factor but then there's the factor that I can't even properly try it on while I'm making it because even if okay great it sits perfectly exactly where I want it to cutting in at the waist when I put it on bottom up but the top doesn't exist yet so if by the time I add the top and the straps, that waist is trying to land three inches higher, three inches lower. Like, I'm just like, what are the odds that I can actually get it to fit the way that I want it to? It might be a thing where like, maybe it can work with some mid project blocks just to check things more along the way, but I'm comfortable doing the calculations. I'm not worried about that. I will happily do all the calculating in the world. I'm just concerned that in the end, it just won't work out the way that the math made me think that it would. But that that's the only door that is obviously open to me. But my question is, do you, is there some other way that you know of that I can accomplish this? Is there some way that you would approach this if you were trying to knit the Fausta bralette, but you wanted it to be extra long, but also have waist shaping? 
how would you approach it? So that's really all I have to say about this project, future project, like it's not even cast on yet at this point. Um, but just to go over the bullet points, so this is in theory going to be the Fausta Rowlet by Low Key Bold Knit. This is a pattern that's inclusive up to a 56 inch bust, so like it's close but not quite there to the 60 inch benchmark we're hoping for and ideally even more than that. So I would love to see this pattern do more, but it's also doing a lot more than a lot of others, so I'm not going to be too critical of it. I am going to be knitting the size 2A, so I'm knitting this out of La Bien Aimee Felix in the color Winterfell held double, which I'm very grateful for because I thought that I might have to hold it triple or even quadruple to meet gauge, but I was good with the two and by upsizing from three millimeter to 3.25 millimeter needles, which I might have had to anyway just because of being a tight knitter, but that's actually the smallest size in my interchangeable set and I just wasn't interested in buying another needle that wouldn't fit into my tidy carrying case. So I thought I would try it out and it worked. The pattern itself costs seven euros, which is about $11 Canadian. And this project is a pretty good deal for me considering the materials that I'm making it out of because I got one skein of La Bien Aimee from my friend Amy and her D-stash. So I only had to buy one other one for the amount of yarn that I'm anticipating needing for this project. Though that rarely works out for me the way I think it's going to, so we shall see. But so the one skein I did need to buy cost me um, about $65, which included $11 in shipping. All in, we're looking at a project cost of $75 Canadian once you include the pattern, which is about $55 US. But again, it would be costing almost double that if I were having to buy both of these skeins myself. So that's it for today. No actual progress on this project. Just, just a question. Just maybe, maybe even negative progress because I thought that I was ready to cast it on as soon as I finished Dad Socks. That was kind of my plan. Um, and that that will not be happening until I um, hopefully receive some guidance from you. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, Allie from the future here um, and Copper. Copper, would you like to say hi? You'll, you'll give a profile? Great. Um, checking in to tell you that um, this video got really out of control in length. So what I decided to do is to split this video into a couple parts. So the next one is going to have my acquisitions, um, which makes a lot of sense because they are all very trip related. And then for the rest of the video, I really wanted to kind of review my knits in the context of the trip that I just brought them on because they were really useful. I just feel like sometimes we don't tend to talk a lot about our garments after we finish them. And I thought this would be an interesting way to kind of check in with them, see how they're doing, see how helpful they're being. So stay tuned for that. That will be coming up on the channel soon. Hey, buggy. Spin. Sit. Hi. Hello. You wanna say hi? You wanna wave? Yeah. Oh, that's a nice butt. Yeah, show everybody your butt. Okay, so that concludes my knitting content. I have to say, in my last video that went up, my mock-ups video, a couple people commented saying that you know, they enjoyed the video but they really missed the book segment and my heart is so warm <laughs> so but like I mentioned I had pre-recorded that video to go up while I was away so at the time that I recorded it I didn't have any like knitting or reading updates to share there were just there was none of that it was a video out of time but it makes me happy to know that there are people who missed this part so it's back today it is time so as for book finished objects we have pumpkin by Julie Murphy tagline this year proms a drag cute rainbow spine. So part of this reading update is actually courtesy of the fact that I ran out of yarn on dead socks on the flight home because our flight home was a daytime flight so I was really trying not to sleep because I wanted to be able to flip my sleep schedule but I ran out of knitting to do and I was like oh no. So the fact that I ran out of yarn so early in my trip is actually the entire reason that I read in its entirety Pumpkin. I read the entirety of this book between the end of that flight and the drive back to my sister's. We flew into Montreal Airport. She lives in Ottawa. It's like a couple hours. And so this book was an absolute delight and it kept me reading and awake when, to me, it was like four in the morning, like Italy time. So I don't feel like I can give you a much better testament than that. When I went to bed, I had about 40 pages of this left, which I desperately wanted to finish it. But again, by the time I got to my sister's house where I was crashing that night, it, it was then like five o'clock in the morning to me. And I was trying so hard to read. My eyes were like forcibly closing. I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna have to accept that I'm gonna have to read the last little bit of this tomorrow. And I did, I managed to sleep for a few hours. I took out just a little reading light to try not to wake myself up too much. And I read the last 40 pages. And then I successfully went back to sleep until it was like, Canadian morning time. So I've read several books from Julie Murphy before. I've read Dumplin' and Puddin', which are the two that are kind of like in the series of this, but they're, they're different characters. It's just kind of set in the same universe. 
So I read both of those and I've also read her book Ramona Blue. So I knew that I really liked her writing. I actually got to meet her several years ago. Editors know I went to take out this photo and realize this was the same book signing where I got to meet Becky Albertalli and Angie Thomas. When has a book event ever been this star-studded? Like simply wild. She came to Indigo in Toronto for a signing when Ramona Blue came out. So I got to get her to sign all my books of hers that I had and meet her. She was so sweet. She's the best. But so this is one of her newer releases. This one's called Pumpkin. The tagline is this year proms a drag. It has this super cute rainbow spine. So this book is about Waylon, who is a high school senior and he is both gay and fat living in small town Texas, which is kind of a rough place to be those things with the people who are surrounding him. And he has developed an interest in drag. And one day he's just kind of having a rough day and to kind of cheer himself up, he sort of as a joke makes an audition tape for like the in this world fictionalized version of RuPaul's Drag Race and then this like accidentally gets shared with his school and of course people are not kind about this and then as kind of a cruel prank he ends up being nominated for prom queen and the story of this book is basically him deciding to embrace it and run for real and there's a really cute love story and a lot of him kind of figuring out what he wants to do with himself in his life now that he's finishing school and while it is obviously dealing with really tough things that Waylon is facing like oppression over his sexuality over his body it's also dealt with in a way that's very like lighthearted and hopeful and it just is such a like feel-good book so highly recommend and then actually one of the things that i find most impressive about this book is that like i mentioned there is a love story and this book is i would say very like pg rated like the romance side of it is very tame even in the category of ya like I feel like my 10 year old niece could read this and yet it was like so engrossing as a love story like I'm so impressed. I've been in kind of a reading rut recently and the fact that I read this in effectively a day it was just I cannot I cannot recommend it more. Okay, and then as far as reading whips, I just realized I don't actually have it here with me, but I'm still reading Fourth Wing by Rebecca Yaros, which I mentioned last time, and I was sort of like, am I gonna get into this? Did you get into this? What's, what's the deal with this book? So I decided not to bring it with me to Italy because it's so big. I think the last time I was around page 90, maybe, my sister had told me she got really into it at page 100. Before that was kind of rough getting in. We're both not fantasy readers, so the world building setup of, of it all is kind of a challenge. But so now I'm at page, I think I'm at page like 180, and... I can't say that I'm like super invested or like compulsively reading it in the way that I hear people talk about, but it is definitely starting to go faster. But the degree is still very, very out on that one. I don't know. I'm just kind of, I think I'm struggling with the writing style. Like it's just not really clicking for me. So I don't know. Unsure. Okay, and now for reading acquisitions. I have, I have reading acquisitions. So still on the trip theme, I picked up this cute little book of Venice. So um, I'll pop a picture here of the bookstore that I got it from. It was cute. It was just this tiny little shop by the Rialto Bridge. So it's just called Venice, but the series is called Panorama Pops. And let me show you. It's this little accordion, like a pop-up of the city of Venice. Here's the Peggy Guggenheim. Like it just, it's so cute. It's so long. It's double-sided. Like it was, it was the 16 euros. I had to have it. So I'm not currently sure if this is going to like live on my bookshelf, kind of like partly open or something, or I am, this might be sacrilege. I might regret saying this on the internet for all time. Um, I'm considering cutting it apart and using pieces of it in my scrapbook. I'm sorry if that offends you. <laughs> my next acquisition is more of one that you would actually read. This is Heartstopper Volume 5. So this is the fifth book in Alice Oseman's series. And this is a graphic novel. And um, this is the series that the Netflix series Heartstopper is based off of. I, I'm really hoping that the second season is coming out soon. The first one was so, so good. Um, and this is just like, I don't know, it's the most wholesome series you've ever read. It's the love story between high schoolers Nick and Charlie. And I think when the series starts, I think they're in like ninth and 10th grade. They're a little bit younger than like YA characters tend to be. And it's a sort of very sweet, like sort of like first love puppy love kind of story where like it's so exciting when you're even just like sitting next to them in class and like, are they moving their hand closer to mine? Are they purposely getting closer to me? Does it mean something? Is something going to happen? Like it's so... This series so perfectly encapsulates like that feeling. I have loved every book in this series so far, so I'm really looking forward to checking out this one. And this will probably be, like because it's a graphic novel, a day that I just want to like sit down and read a book and I'll probably just read it cover to cover. So I'm not sure exactly when that day will be, but I know it's gonna be a good day. Okay, now my last acquisition is one that I'm really like personally excited for. So this is Julia Hungry by Hannah Louise Poston. This is a book of poems. Hannah is a YouTuber. She does sort of like beauty and fashion content in like the most poetic 
and thoughtful way you can possibly imagine. Part of this, part of the reason that she is so poetic in her expression is that she is a poet. So this book is a result of her having won the Anthony Hecht Poetry Prize and Waywiser Press publishing her work. And I'm a Patreon supporter of Hannah's, so I was able to watch like the video that she made for her patrons about this. And in that video, she was talking about how she almost can't even like wrap her head around how much this means to her because as someone who is, I think, I think she's 39 now, as someone who's been working on this for like literal decades, like 20 plus years that she's been working toward this goal and not reached it yet, that she was starting to have to try to make peace with the fact that it might not happen for her, that she was going to continue trying, but that it had to be okay if it didn't happen. As somebody who is 30 and has been trying to work toward publication of novels myself, that hit home. So to know like how hard and how persistently she worked for this to now like have it in my hand as an object while I don't know her personally I know that I am very invested in her as a person so just to be able to hold this book and to know how much it means to her that makes it mean a lot to me and just like look at it it's beautiful it's like a dream incarnate you know and I'm also like I will read some poetry I don't consider myself like really good at reading poetry but I'm also not like really scared of poetry in the way that I know that a lot of people are. <laughs> so what I think is really cool that Hannah is doing is before her book came out, she did a video where she talked through some of the other poems kind of from like the canon of Western poetry that she is sort of referencing and riffing off of and like challenging so that you could read them in advance and kind of have them in your head and be prepared for this sort of like intertextuality that she's very deliberately doing. And then holding the book, the thing that I didn't realize that I find really interesting that I like a lot. So one of the poems of hers is playing off of the poem Archaic Torso of Apollo by Rilke, R Rilke? I don't remember how she pronounced it. It's been too long since I watched that video, but on the page of this poem, it actually says after Rilke. So it's telling you on the page that this is an intertextual piece. Like I think it's very common for pieces of art to reference other pieces of art, but it's usually a very like, if you know, you know sort of thing. So I just really love this choice she's made to make the intertextuality of her work not be like an if you know, you know thing, but instead like, if you know, great. And if you don't, let me tell you. Because I, I would have read this poem and had absolutely no idea that it was referring to another poem. But she has given me the option of like, I can just read it as is if I want to. But if I want to get that extra layer of meaning, she's telling me where to go and where to look. And I just feel like I, I really appreciate that level of like accessibility. Like, help me, help me understand. <laughs> like as someone who's not studied poetry, I think that's really cool. I don't know, I just really like the way that Hannah talks about poetry. I really love the way Hannah talks. <laughs> so I'm really excited to read the way she writes her poetry. So congratulations, Hannah. I am so, so excited about this book. All right, so I feel like that was an absolute metric ton of content. I have been talking for hours. <laughs> so here's to hoping that um, by the time you're watching this, I've edited it down into something remotely reasonable and not in the category of a feature length film. So if I did, thank you so much for watching. And if I didn't, my God, thank you all the more for watching because you've been here a very long time. So if you actually made it this long, I, I need to find like a trophy to give you. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching. If you'd like to be here next time for my next feature film, I would love it if you would subscribe and I'll see you next time. Bye.